This is going to be the overview for 2 John. Now, the author, obviously, the Apostle John. Not John the Baptist, but the Apostle John. His name means Jehovah is gracious. It's got one chapter, 13 verses, and around 298 words. The theme is dividing love of the truth. The three applications, historically, John encourages the saints to continue walking in truth. He warns them about deceivers who are entered into the world. Doctrinally, the doctrine of Christ is the litmus test for the last days, and the enemies of God will be the man of sin and his followers. Devotionally, you got a proper balance of truth and love, love and truth. Supporting the deceiver and bidding him Godspeed is not truth or love. So watch out, supporting deceivers. Now, 2 John 1, 1, The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. You see, John is all about the truth. He says it over and over again in this chapter. John is a Bible believer, and he can spot the truth when he sees it. John is the elder, speaking to the elect lady. And 2 John 1, 2, For the truth's sake which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. That is the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. John 16, 13 says that it will guide you into all truth. The truth dwells in you if you're saved. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Somebody said to me that Jesus Christ isn't God. They said he's just the Son of God. But do you not realize that by calling him the Son of God, you actually make him equal with God? It says in John 5, 18, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. If you say that Jesus is the Son of God, that you're just making him equal with God. He is God. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. He's the Son of God, but He's also God Himself. It says in 2 John 1, 4, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father, walking in truth. That's a great phrase, but today that's a foreign thing. You see, people wake up in lies. They have lies on their news feed on Facebook. Uh, fact checkers don't know very much facts that come through and fact check everything and they want to say that the truth is not true. Uh, the news media is a bunch of liars. The college professors are liars who profess themselves to be wise but yet they become fools. Uh, the magazines at the counters of grocery stores are filled with lies. The pastors in the pulpits are for the most part liars and deceivers. But not John. John rejoices greatly to find the little children walking in truth, even with all this lies going on. If you have children, you should rejoice if they care about God even a little bit. And I mean, your your children that you, and the sense of the people that you've won to the Lord, those types of children, and then your physical children as well. If you've got children that are walking in truth, that's an amazing miracle today. It says in 2 John 1, 5, And I beseech thee, lady, which would be Israel, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. Romans 13, 9 through 10, For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be, be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So he said, Not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And Paul said, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And Paul listed out all those uh, commandments there. You see, if you love your neighbor, you're not going to commit adultery with his wife. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to steal this stuff. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to lie to him. You're not going to be mad at him because he has nicer stuff than you, and you're not going to covet his stuff. If you just love everyone around you, it will keep you out of sin. So John says, I wrote 
Not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And Paul said in Romans 13, 10, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. If you just love somebody like you ought to, you're not going to sin against them. Second John 1, 6, And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Sometimes people act as if the commandments are a drag. Now, they don't, don't you realize, though, that if everyone kept the commandments in this book, that you wouldn't have to lock your doors. There wouldn't have to be a prison, prisons everywhere. There wouldn't be any fear of mass shootings and drive-bys and serial killers and abortion clinics and drag queen story hour or rape or gang initiations or riots and everything else that is messed up in this world. Don't you realize that? That if people kept the commandments, you're not going to have to worry about that stuff. It says in Second John 1, 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Once again, the people who say Jesus Christ isn't come in the flesh are liars. They are not walking in truth. And Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. And for someone to deny that shows they have the spirit of antichrist. You see, the mystery of iniquity is already at work. And Antichrist are paving the way for the Antichrist. He's got a bunch of forerunners. And it seems like through history, the devil's always grooming a man who could become the Antichrist. And in Second John 1, 8, it says, Look to yourselves, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. There are going to be a lot of saints that don't get a full reward because they gave their support to these false teachers that have an antichrist spirit. They didn't try to try the spirit to see whether or not they were of God. It says in verse 9 and 10, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. You see, this is so serious that you don't want to receive them into your house. Don't receive him in the sense that you go along with him and make him seem like he's an okay guy. Because he's not an okay guy if he doesn't have the doctrine of Christ. He's a, a wicked man. He's a dangerous liar and a dangerous false teacher that could lead many people to hell. Never bid him Godspeed. Don't say God bless you, good luck, or the Lord be with you, or have a nice day or anything like that. I don't believe this is a, a warning not to let them come in your house. I believe it's a, a warning not to receive them. You know, don't go along with it. Don't make them think that they're, what they're doing is okay. You know, I've heard of people letting uh, people in like this that's coming around ev evangelizing the, these false gospels and things. They let them in. They show them the truth from the Bible. I don't think that's receiving them even though you let them walk through the door because they're not going along with what they're saying, you see. In 2 John 1, 11, it says, For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. You see, imagine telling the guy, God bless you, and I wish you the best. And uh, he, you see, the guy gets encouraged from that, goes to the next house, and possibly gets a convert for his cult. You'd have a part in that evil. You encouraged it. You know, you don't want to bid him God's speed. You don't be partaker of his evil deeds. Verse 12, Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. See, sometimes a text message won't do. You want to talk about it on the phone. Sometimes a phone call won't do. You want to speak face to face. And John wanted to speak face to face. So that's a quick overview of Second John. This will be the overview for Third John. Third John has one chapter, 14 verses. And 294 words are around that. It has the fewest words. And the theme is the distributing love of the truth. The author is John. The Apostle John, not John the Baptist. And our three applications. Historically, John writes to Gaius. 
for his appreciation for Gaius's charity and providing for the traveling saints, and he contrasts Gaius with a selfish man named Diotrephes. And doctrinally, he is encouraging saints of the tribulation time period to sacrifice like Gaius and to avoid the ultimate Diotrephes, which would be the Antichrist. Devotionally, what can you get out of this for yourself today? Dis- distributing to those, distri- distribute to those who want the Lord to have the preeminence. In Third John one one, the elder unto the well beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. John is the elder, and he's writing to a brother named Gaius, and he loves him in the truth. And there are some people out there that you would have a hard time loving if they didn't have the truth dwelling in them and that same truth dwelling in you. Because you have nothing in common and you're completely two completely different people, two completely different sinners. And there's a lot of people that you would not even be friends with right now if you hadn't been saved and they hadn't been saved. He says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. John's idea of prosperity isn't the same as the TV evangelist. What you get from those nuts isn't prosperity that has to do with the soul, but rather a worldly prosperity. They think the treasures down here are more important than that stuff up there. And it says in verse 3, For I rejoice greatly that when the, when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. You see, if you're a born-again believer, then it is a great thing when the brethren can come and testify that you have the truth in you. Sometimes I can hear someone give a testimony, a sermon, a teaching, or just a conversation with them, and I start thinking how this person has the truth in him. I think he's got it. He's got the truth. He he believes like me. He's got the right Bible. He's got the right gospel. He believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. In 3 John 1, 4, it says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You see, rejoice if the people you have won to the Lord are walking in truth. But at the same time, I'm always thinking about how people should be thankful that their physical children also walk in truth. Kids and teenagers and young adults these days are walking according to the course of this world, not the truth. You need to be thankful if they are. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church. Whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. They have borne witness of his charity. They're telling everybody about the charity of Gaius. And you don't have to make a name for yourself. Go around doing good, and this will automatically let people know who you are. It says in 3 John 1, 7 through 9, Because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such, that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes. Now here's the selfish man. Here's the guy that's self-centered and wants the spotlight on him. He says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. See, there are certain people that you're going to come in contact with who want to have the preeminence. Even though in Colossians 1.18, it shows us that in all things, the Lord needs to have the preeminence. He's the one who should be having the preeminence, not Diotrephes, not the big-time evangelist that comes in like he owns the world, not the pastor, not the deacons, not any member of a local church, but the Lord needs the preeminence. And look how John handles Diotrephes. He says in verse 10, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Notice John said, I will remember his deeds which he doeth. This doesn't mean uh, that John is going to sit and dwell on what the uh, Diotrephes character has done and let it fester inside of him until he becomes bitter. This means that there are some people 
that you have to remember what they've done because they might do it again. And you don't want to just hold stuff against people, but you can't just forget certain things that they could possibly do again. And be aware of the dangers uh, about people. This Diotrephes prates, prates against them with malicious words. And to prate means to talk much, but without weight or with little purpose. And malicious means harboring ill will or enmity. So Diotrephes is doing a lot of talking, a lot of moving that mouth with malicious words. And this means he's just running his mouth in pure hatred for people. Most times because he's simply concerned with who shall be the greatest and he wants to be the greatest and wants to sit on the throne of whatever movement he might be in. He just constantly running his mouth. And John says below, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. You see, the one that does good in you is the new creature. That's what's doing good inside the born-again believer. And Jesus is doing that through you. It can only, the new creature can only do good. The one who does evil has to be the flesh. And Paul explains it perfectly in Romans seven nineteen through 24, where he says, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. See, the, his flesh does evil. The inner man does good. He says, Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. You see, the inward man loves the law of God. Then look what he says, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. And he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He called himself a wretch. And he wants to be delivered from this body of death because he's sick of sin. And the flesh wants to sin. But John says there in 3 John 1, 12, Demetrius hath good report of all men and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. I had many things to write, but I, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. But I trust I shortly shall I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee, our friends salute thee, greet the friends by name. Just as Paul wanted to see the saints face to face, like he said in first Thessalonians two seventeen, he says he endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. John wants to speak face to face with the saints.